This is Anna Pinedo, and um, we welcome you to our presentation on Rule 10b-51 Amendments Guidance for Issuers, Insiders, and Financial Intermediaries. So um, Jennifer Carlson, David Schutte, and Laura Richmond and I will go through a number of the changes that were brought about by the SEC's adoption of the Rule 10b-51 amendments, as well as some practical considerations, as we note on the cover page, both for issuers as well as for investment banks that serve as um, 10b-51 agents. Today, um, we're offering CLE credit for those of you who are participating in the live session. And we're gonna read the CLE code at least twice during today's program. So we'll, we'll read it aloud when the CLE screen, uh, the CLE code pops up on the screen. If you'll just make note of it and include it in the CLE forms, the CLE forms have been circulated with today's materials. If you'll return those to the Mayor Brown address that's listed, you'll um, get CLE credit for today. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, you can just go ahead and pose those by typing the question into the chat box. And we'll try and answer the questions either as we go through the presentation materials or toward the end of the session. Um, if we don't get to any of the questions, then um, one of us will just respond to you after today's session. We'll also be circulating a copy of the materials from today's presentation, along with a copy of our client alert on the Rule 10b-51 amendments and a link to a recording of today's presentation. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. On the next slide, just a quick um, link, a quick example of our agenda. Um, and we'll dive right into a little bit of the background, some um, basics on Rule 10b-51. And so that we have, um, a, we'll go to slide four, Hanson, a common understanding of the affirmative defense. So Rule 10b-51 was adopted by the Securities and Exchange Commission in 2000. Um, it's notable that this is the first amendment since 2000. When it was adopted, it was really intended to provide clarity regarding the meaning of manipulative or uh, deceptive devices or contrivances that um, are prohibited by Section 10b, which is really um, one of the principal anti-fraud provisions in um, the securities laws in the Exchange Act. And over time, um, courts have, have really um, taken different views on the connection that has to be shown between um, a person's possession of material non-public information and trading in order to establish liability for purposes of Section 10b and Rule 10b-5. Clients, especially foreign clients, non-US persons often ask if there's a federal statute in the United States that specifically prohibits insider trading. From time to time, including quite recently, Congress has considered an insider trading statute, but actually has never adopted one. Um, so the SEC addressed um, a lot or attempted to address some of the ambiguity regarding the, the meaning of uh, some of the, the words that I just went through in Section 10b by providing specifically that a uh, the purchase or sale of an issuer's security on the basis of material non-public information, either about the security or about the issuer for purposes of Section 10b and specifically Rule 10b-5, if uh, the person it is prohibited, if the person is, is making making the purchase or the sale was aware of the material non-public information when the transaction, the purchase or sale was made. 10b-51 establishes an affirmative defense. If we go to the next slide, the affirmative defense is available both 
to, to persons and to entities. So trades that are made pursuant to trading plans that were properly established, and we'll spend a fair bit of time talking about what that means, are deemed not to have been made on the basis of material non-public information. Uh, when the rule was adopted in 2000, the commission made clear that it's also available to entities, including to the issuer of securities, um, the issuer itself, so a public company. And public companies have um, increasingly, though they were reluctant at first to rely on 10b-51, they've increasingly relied on 10b-51 as a defense, for example, in conjunction with 10b-18 stock repurchase programs. So it provides that the entity is not liable if it demonstrates that the person that makes an investment decision on behalf of the entity was not aware of material non-public information and the issuer had implemented appropriately reasonable policies and procedures that were intended to prevent insider trading. A 10b-51 plan, a trading plan, as we'll refer to it, is a plan that's intended to comply with Rule 10b-51 C of, of the Exchange Act. So on the next slide, in order to benefit from the affirmative defense, a plan has to essentially put things on automatic pilot. So it has to specify the amount, the price, and the date of purchases or sales. Now, all of these things, amount and price, for example, um, amount and price can be formulaic. And a lot of plans do um, get quite complex in terms of how they um, come to uh, deriving the amount and the price of securities. And they can include a written formula um, for determining all of those. And they can't permit the person, the maker of the plan, to exercise any subsequent influence regarding when or whether to execute the purchases or sales. That's the subsequent influence um, is the part that's come into question over time. So if we go to the next slide, why uh, these amendments and what has led to this? So these amendments come after a very um, significant period of discussion. There have been uh, numerous articles um, in the popular press, the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, um, other, uh, other sources, as well as academic publications that have looked at in a very systematic way um, how insiders have sold securities pursuant to plans. And um, some of this concern was specifically heightened during the pandemic period when insiders were unfortunately, in hindsight, seen to have profited um, through um, plans from um, announcements or um, decisions taken um, by their companies, perhaps at the expense of shareholders, um, or perhaps when um, information uh, may not have been um, widely disclosed or broadly available. So what many of these scholarly articles have um, pointed out is that um, given that the given the way Rule 10b-51 was previously prior to these amendments written, it was technically possible for an insider um, to have complied with the rule while um, benefiting, um, or um, that there may have been loopholes. Uh, things that they pointed to were that insiders were consistently outperforming um, trading by other insiders that weren't trading under plans. Insiders were making trades soon after uh, adopting or modifying a plan that were disproportionately large. Um, insiders that were using um, multiple or overlapping plans. Um, in practice, just as um, counsel, I have to say that we don't really see very many instances and have not seen very many instances of multiple overlapping plans. 
um, there were a number of, of academic articles regarding gifts. So uh, donations, philanthropic um, uh, donations or charitable contributions, as well as donations to uh, or gifts to relatives made while um, insiders were purportedly or allegedly aware of material non-public information. Inside uh, issuers, uh, again, allegedly using plans to make share repurchases, uh, again, uh, allegedly to boost share prices um, ahead of insider sales, and then uh, questionable uh, grants of, of stock options, um, questionable in, in connection with or when looked at in coordination with the release of material non-public information. So all of these articles in the popular press, um, the academic studies um, prompted the prior SEC chair, Chair Clayton, um, as well as the SEC's Investor Advisory Committee um, to look at um, Rule 10b-51 for um, possible amendment. Chair Clayton had uh, considered and had a dialogue with uh, Congress about potential changes to Rule 10b-51, which are not all that different than um, what we're going to talk to you about today. Um, there were a number of exchanges of letters. Um, many of those letters uh, originally authored by Senator Warren, uh, again, among others, that called for um, changes that were far more stringent than the changes that we see today. And in fact, um, current SEC Chair Gensler had in many of his um, remarks, both SEC uh, formal uh, testimony uh, to Congress uh, in connection with Congress's oversight of the SEC, as well as in speeches, um, talked about changes that, that uh, went significantly beyond those um, that were adopted in the final rule. So uh, a couple of things about um, the amendments, which um, will become clear as uh, Dave, Laura, and Jen discuss them in more detail. I would say that on the whole, um, the SEC's proposed amendments triggered significant concern, in particular um, because many of the changes that had been proposed um, were seen as unworkable, as uh, unnecessarily restrictive, um, in particular those that had been proposed um, for issuers. And, and Dave will talk about how the cooling off period um, ended up. Um, there were a significant number of comments from market participants on the SEC's proposed amendments. And uh, there had been some skepticism that perhaps the commission and its now configuration would not be particularly receptive to the comments. Um, that were submitted and the concerns that were voiced, um, particularly given the fact that even during the comment period, um, there were a number of, again, more letters um, from the Hill to the SEC asking for even more conservative or restrictive changes to, to Rule 10b-51. So it's, it's somewhat encouraging, and I say encouraging, as perhaps as a harbinger of, of what's to come um, with respect to all the many uh, rules that the SEC has proposed and, and has yet to adopt, but has on its um, rulemaking agenda as to be adopted in the coming months that the SEC did take into account a significant number of the comments that um, the public made with respect to Rule 10b-51. And of course, many of the changes that we're gonna talk about today with respect to 10b-51 um, affect, or there's an interplay between the Rule 10b-51 comments 
uh, or changes and those um, to come with um, share repurchase disclosure um, proposed changes, which are to be adopted later as Laura will discuss. Um, so with that as background and as a prelude, I'm gonna hand things over to Dave to dive into um, the details. Thank you, Anna. Um, well, the most, the first and the most significant change um, that is, was affected by the amendments is the imposition of a mandatory cooling off period. Um, go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, that is the minimum period that needs to elapse between the time the person enters into the plan and the first trade that can occur under the plan. Um, many issuers have on their own uh, historically imposed a, a minimum 30 day uh, cooling off period, but now there's a mandatory cooling off period uh, under the rule. Uh, the good news, it doesn't apply uh, to issuers um, absent some additional rulemaking. Uh, but for directors and executive officers, uh, as defined for Section 16 purposes, um, their cooling off period uh, it will be um, will require that their trades not begin until the later of 90 days and two business days after the filing of the Form 10K or the Form 10Q or the quarter during which the plan was adopted, but not to exceed 120 days. So one can think of 120 days being the maximum minimum cooling off period. While this appeared to be an improvement over what the SEC had originally uh, proposed as 120 days, uh, there are some practical difficulties that um, will come from relying on the filing of SEC, SEC filings for 10B51 plans. Um, first off, if you are going to have a plan that specifies that the trades are to begin two business days after the filing of a Form 10-K or Form 10-Q, that means someone, and it's not clear to me at this point who that someone is going to be, is going to have to monitor the SEC filings to make sure that they're been made, um, and, then, and only then affect the trades two business days later. Alternatively, uh, one can uh, look at when the SEC filings are scheduled to be made, add a couple business days and maybe a little uh, cushion uh, and specify that as the date for the trades to begin. But again, uh, that still requires someone to um, make sure that the filings have in fact been made on schedule. And if they haven't, and the filing still hasn't been made by the date that's put forth in the plan, then the, the trade would not have the benefit of the rule. Um, and one could change, uh, modify the plan at that point, but, but then you have to have a new cooling off period. So some issuers have looked at this and at least I know one has kind of thrown up their hands and said, maybe we should just have 120 days um, cooling off period. Um, others I know have put together some fairly detailed uh, schedules showing when during an open window period, uh, based on their projected open window periods in the coming year, the plans can be made where the 90 days will be the determinant for the cooling off period and when during the open window, the two business days after the filing will be the determinant of the cooling off period. Um, but again, this certainly adds some complication to the rule. Um, far less complicated uh, is what the rule requires for all other persons who have to have a cooling off period, such as employees or large shareholders who are intending to rely on the rule. Uh, their cooling off period is a simple 30 calendar days. Um, as I mentioned, um, the mod any modification uh, constitutes a termination of the plan and requires the starting of a new cooling off period. 
Uh, I think it has long been understood that modifying a plan uh, constitutes the uh, entering into a new plan. The consequences now are, are now are different. Before, you just had to be sure you were doing that during an open window period. But now if you do that, uh, you not only have to do it during an open window period, but you're going to have to uh, have a new cooling off period start. So um, moving on to the next new requirement, uh, DNO certifications. Um, again, next slide. The this will only applies to directors and officers, um, and they have to make a certification in the plan that the individual is not aware of any material non-public information, and the plan is being adopted in good faith and not part of a plan or scheme to evade the prohibitions of the rule. I think, uh, in my experience, most brokerage forms already have this or something very similar in the plan itself. Um, so this shouldn't be much of a, a burden. Uh, it just needs to uh, follow the wording of the um, of the requirement. Uh, the next item, uh, the next new requirement are uh, over the prohibition on overlapping plans. Uh, again, this is does not apply to issuers, uh, at least for the time being, but to anyone else who's seeking to rely on the affirmative defense of the rule. Uh, under this requirement, uh, one may not enter into a new plan while having another Rule 10b-51 plan outstanding with three exceptions. Uh, the first exception is that you can have separate plans with different brokers that together constitute a single plan. Uh, this might arise in the situation where uh, an executive has shares um, in a plan with the company's uh, captive broker that are part of the um, uh, executive um, equity incentive plan, uh, but also may own shares outside of that uh, in a separate brokerage account, that individual could put together a plan, two different agreements, but together constitute a single plan. Uh, second exception are plans that work back to back. Uh, that is that those are permitted if the transactions under the second plan do not begin until transactions under the first plan have been completed or expire. Um, there is a caveat here, though, uh, in that if one were to terminate uh, the first plan before it has all the sh shares have been sold or otherwise expired, then a new cooling off period is required. Um, so if the first plan is terminated early, then that date, uh, from that date to the first trade under the second plan has to comply with the cooling off period, the applicable cooling off period, which would be um, the later of 90 days or two business days after the filing of the 10K or 10Q in the case of directors or executive officers or 30 days in the case of others. The third exception to the prohibition on overlapping plans are so-called sell to cover plans. These are plans where the individual directs a broker to sell a sufficient number of shares to satisfy the tax withholding upon the vesting of a uh, equity award, uh, such as a vesting of a restricted stock unit. Uh, these can only cover uh, the amount necessary to satisfy the tax withholding. Still another um, new requirement that's been built into the rule are is the limitations on single trade plans. Um, again, uh, this is does not apply to issuers, uh, but to anyone else who's seeking to rely on the affirmative defense of the rule. Under this element of the rule, um, if the plan is not an eligible sell to cover plan, the kind we just discussed, and is designed to affect the purchase or sale of all the securities under the plan in a single transaction, then that individual may not have entered into another 
rule 10b51 plan that's similarly designed during the prior 12 month period. Um, as the you might guess from the word designed uh, that introduces a certain element of ambiguity into uh, this uh, part of the rule. What does it mean to be designed to affect the purchase or sale of all the securities in a single transaction? The SEC said it's not designed. It's uh, not designed to affect uh, all the purchases or sales in a single transaction if there are different volumes of securities to be sold based on different price points. And it's reasonably foreseeable uh, that they would not be affected in a single transaction. Um, so I think in, as an example, if the stock is trading at $25 a share and uh, someone has a plan that provides for some shares, some amount of shares to be sold when the uh, price is 30 and more shares to be sold if the price is 35, uh, if when the plan, um, when the first trade is to be affected, stock prices at 36, or well, all presumably all those shares that then get sold at 36, but because of the differential in the price, uh, that presumably is not designed to affect purchases or sales in a single transaction. Uh, that does leave one to question what, you know, how far away from the, uh, how far apart those prices need to be and whether or not there's, they have to be um, some uh, delta between the current price and, and the uh, sale prices for that to be not designed to affect purchases or sales. I mean, what if this, in my example, what if the stock is 25 and the plan is entered into and the plan calls for sales at $26 and 26 and an eighth, um, who knows? Uh, to me, I think the simplest way to avoid this is just to provide that there are sales remade on multiple dates. Um, so um, we'll see how this works out in practice and whether there's any additional guidance there. Uh, the final new requirement uh, moving along is the requirement to act in good faith with respect to the plan. In order to have the benefit of the affirmative defense, the person must enter into the plan in good faith, which is the existing requirement, but they must now also act in good faith with respect to the plan. And the SEC has um, made clear that what they were worried about um, is, to, is deterring manipulation of the timing of issuer disclosures by executive officers who might, um, knowing what the their their plans are um, could delay or accelerate the timing of disclosures to their benefit. Uh, and that is it for my piece. And I think I'll be now turning this over to Jennifer. Thanks, Dave. So let's transition into talking about the new disclosure requirements for public companies related to Rule 10b-51. Next slide. Currently, there are no company disclosure requirements when an insider adopts or uses or terminates a 10b-51 plan. But when the amendments become effective, public companies that report on domestic forms, so on Form 10-K or Form 10-Q, will need to start providing disclosure on a quarterly basis of the adoption or termination by insiders of both 10b-51 plans and non-Rule 10b-51 trading arrangements. And the final rule includes a definition of non-Rule 10b-51 trading arrangements. And that definition recognizes that other trading plans or arrangements may not comply with the Rule 10b-51 affirmative defense, but those plans could still be a defense to liability under Section 10b. So the new quarterly disclosure requirement may be found in a new item 408 under regulation SK and corresponding amendments to forms 10K and 10Q. And it's important to note that this disclosure is not required for plans adopted by the issuer 
as was originally proposed, but disclosure is only required for plans or arrangements adopted by directors or officers. So the relevant form will require that the company disclose whether during its last fiscal quarter, any director or officer adopted or terminated a 10 b 51 plan or a non-Rule 10 b 51 trading arrangement. The company will, of course, need to provide the name and the title of the officer or director, and then the material terms of the 10 b 51 plan or the arrangement. And item 408 includes a list of examples of material terms, which are the date of adoption or termination of the plan, the duration of the plan, the aggregate number of securities to be sold or purchased. And terms with respect to price do not need to be disclosed. And that's a departure from the original proposal from the commission. And the company must also indicate whether the plan is a Rule 10b-51 plan or a non-Rule 10b-51 trading arrangement. And in addition, as Dave mentioned, modifications of plan can constitute terminations. So under the new rules, these modifications would also require disclosure. And although disclosure is not required for plans adopted by an issuer, the SEC's adopting release did indicate that the commission is continuing to consider whether this type of disclosure would be warranted. Next slide, please. So currently companies are also not required to publicly disclose their insider trading policies. And once the rules are effective, annual disclosure regarding those policies will be required for public companies. The annual disclosure requirement is also found in new item 408 under regulation SK, and the disclosures will be required in annual reports on form 10K, proxy and information statements on schedules 14A and 14C, and annual reports on Form 20F for foreign private issuers. Specifically, companies will need to disclose whether they have adopted insider trading policies and procedures that are reasonably designed to promote compliance with insider trading laws and applicable listing standards. Companies that have such policies will be required to file the insider trading policy as an exhibit to their annual report. Companies that do not have such policies will be required to explain why they have not adopted one. The SEC's original proposal would have required companies to describe their insider trading policies and procedures within the body of the annual report. But in response to comment letters, the SEC changed the final rule to only require companies to file a copy of the policies and procedures instead of providing a more fulsome description in the report itself. The new disclosure mandate is similar to the current requirement under item 406 for companies to disclose whether they have a code of ethics, and if not, why they have not adopted such a code. But unlike the requirement regarding a code of ethics, which may be posted on a company's website and not filed on Edgar, the insider trading policy must be filed as an, as an exhibit. So website posting will not be sufficient. And finally, as an important reminder, the disclosures required in Form 10-K and Form 20-F are subject to the Sarbanes-Oxley 302 certifications. So a company's principal executive officer and principal financial officer must certify that the annual report does not contain untrue statements of material fact or omit to state facts, material facts necessary to make the statements in that report not misleading with respect to the periods covered by the report. And as the SEC stated in the adopting release, these officers may be liable if they are ignorant about information disclosed in the report or if they know such information is false. Next slide, please. So also in the adopting release, the commission explained that it believes that existing principles-based disclosure for executive comp is not sufficient to inform investors about the potential practices relating to the granting of equity awards. So the commission in the release referred to practices including bullet dodging, 
which is where a company delays the grant of an option until after the release of negative news, and spring loading, which is where a company grants an option immediately before the release of positive news. So although equity awards are currently required to be presented in a tabular format, awards made close in time to a company's release of material non-public information are not required to be separately identified by the current rules. The commission did acknowledge that companies may have reasons for granting these types of awards, but they also stated that these practices warranted increased transparency, particular to, particularly to assist stockholders with decisions on SAM pay votes and director elections. So in a move that the commission described as a further enhancement of executive compensation disclosure, they adopted new item 402X under regulation SK. So item 402X is intended to enhance disclosure for options and similar equity instruments that are granted close in time to the release of material non-public information. The new item will require both narrative disclosure and a new table, and it is required in annual reports on Form 10-K and certain proxy and information statements. So for the 10-K requirement, like other executive compensation matters, the disclosure can be incorporated by reference from a proxy statement that is filed within 120 days of the company's fiscal year end. But unlike other ex executive disclosure, executive comp disclosure, smaller reporting companies and emerging growth companies are not exempt from these requirements. Um, but consistent with the scaled approach for these types of companies for executive comp disclosure, SRCs and EGCs are allowed to limit this disclosure to the smaller set of named executive officers for which other compensation disclosure is provided. So the narrative disclosure will require companies to describe their policies and their practices on the timing of awards of stock options, stock appreciation rights, and similar option-like instruments in relation to the company's disclosure of MNPI, including those that are listed on the slide, how the board determines when to grant awards, whether and how the board takes MNPI into account when determining the timing and the terms of an award, and whether the company has timed the release of MNPI for the purposes of affecting the value of executive compensation. Importantly, new item 402X does not require companies to specifically adopt policies and procedures on the timing of their equity awards, and it also does not require the modification of any existing policies and practices. Next slide, please. The tabular disclosure required by 402X will require companies to disclose awards that were made in the past fiscal year if those awards were made in windows surrounding the disclosure of MNPI. The window starts four business days before the filing of a periodic report, such as a 10K or a 10Q, or before the filing or the furnishing of a Form 8K that discloses MNPI. So this would, of course, include earnings releases that are furnished on Form 8K. And the window ends one business day after the filing. The length of the window is actually a change from the commission's original proposal, which would have required companies to list awards that were made in the 14-day window before or after the filing of a periodic report, an issuer share repurchase, or the filing or furnishing of a Form 8K that discloses MNPI. So in addition to shortening the window for disclosure of awards, the commission also removed the share repurchase disclosure trigger. If a company grants these types of awards, options or similar type awards, during this window to named executive officers or directors, the awards must be disclosed on an award by award basis, including the information listed in the table on this slide. So specifically, the table must include the NEO or director name, the grant date of the award, the aggregate number of shares underlying the award, the exercise price of the award, the grant date fair value of the award, and finally, the change in value of the underlying stock, which 
will be shown as a percentage change from one day prior to the disclosure of the material non-public information to one day after such disclosure. So again, as a reminder, all companies will need to include the narrative disclosure going forward. Uh, the tabular disclosure, however, will be limited to only those awards that are made within the window that's required by the SEC. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Laura to continue our presentation. Thanks, Jen. Uh, next slide, please. So under the amendments, gifts of equity securities are going to have to be reported on Form 4, and that's within two business days after the gift is made. And that's a major change for gift reporting because right now they're allowed to be done on a Form 5, which is due 45 days after calendar year end. So before the amendment, gifts could be voluntarily reported earlier on a Form 4, but Section 16 reporters had the luxury of a big cushion in some cases with more than a year to report a gift. And you also need to keep in mind that any late Form 4 filing uh, has to be disclosed in proxy statements. So officers and directors, as you might guess, generally hate being publicly named as late with an SEC filing. So really, people have to get up to speed on this new requirement for reporting gifts. And if you're wondering why the SEC felt it important to accelerate the date, um, the change in effect uh, reflects that gifts of securities are subject to the insider trading laws, and the amendments were designed to curb potential abuses through gifts. Specifically, the SEC was concerned that the delayed reporting could let Section 16 persons engage in problematic practices involving gifts of equity securities. Uh, for example, uh, the SEC was worried that insiders could make stock gifts while in possession of material non-public information, or they could backdate their stock gifts. And they might do this to maximize uh, tax benefits associated with gifts. And the SEC agreed with academics that a gift closely followed by a sale under conditions where the value at the time of donation and sale affects the tax or other benefits could raise the same policy concerns as more common forms of insider trading, observing that a gift made with the knowledge that a recipient will soon sell could be seen as in effect a sale for cash followed by a gift of the cash. Reporting persons can use a 10 v 5 one plan for gifts if they want, but that won't change the new two-day uh, reporting schedule. Uh, next slide, please. The amendments also added a mandatory rule 10 v 5 one checkbox to both forms four and five. As you can see from this slide, the box needs to be checked if the reported transaction was made pursuant to a contract instruction or written plan intended uh, to satisfy the affirmative defense uh, conditions of Rule 10 b 5 c The checkbox is intended to provide transparency into the use of 10 v 5 one plans to help uh, deter misuse of uh, trading plans. The SEC envisions this requirement as a complement to the cooling off period. The SEC suggested that the checkbox might be useful to investors in combination with disclosures regarding the adoption and termination of 10b51 plans because it can help them identify instances in which an officer or director may have opportunistically canceled or terminated uh, a plan or a trade. And it's possible uh, the SEC thought that the potential effects of this disclosure could in fact discourage such opportunistic cancellations. Whatever the underlying, uh, underlying rationale for the new box, it's important for anyone preparing Form 4 and 5 filings to confirm that the Edgar platform they're using is adding the checkbox to their templates. Some people have included a voluntary footnotes in Form 4s to identify that a reported uh, sale was affected pursuant to a 10 b 5 plan. Once they're required to use the checkbox, uh, 
company and these reporting persons may want to consider whether uh, they need to continue that practice, particularly if the form only reports a 10B51 plan transaction. The SEC had originally proposed but didn't adopt checkboxes uh, for uh, um, non uh, 10 b 51 plans. Next slide. Um, and as shown on this slide, uh, the SCC's uh, amendments extended the inline XBRL tagging requirement uh, to new disclosures, such as the granting of option and option like awards close in time to the release of MNPI or the adoption of uh, Rule 10 b 51 plan uh, by directors and officers, and also the disclosure regarding intra insider trading policies and procedures. Um, go to slide 30 now, because it's important to understand what the effective date is for all of this stuff. And there's both good news and bad news for timing. First, for the challenge. Rule 10b-5 amendments will be effective February 27th, 2023, just a little over a month away. And there's no phase-in for the compliance with the new Rule 10 b 51 requirements that Dave discussed earlier. But the SEC did provide for some grandfathering, uh, so the amendments don't affect Rule 10 b 51 plans entered into before the effective date unless they're modified after, on or after uh, the effective date to be treated as a new trading arrangement under the rule. The rules also provide some phase in of the reporting requirements. So for most companies, disclosure and inline XBRL tagging requirements become effective with the filings covering the first full fiscal period on or after, uh, beginning on or after April 1st, 2023. And the good news for calendar year companies is that this means the disclosures won't impact their upcoming 10Ks or proxy statements. Um, you could, if you want, mention in the proxy statement that the company has adopted uh, an insider trading. Perhaps uh, if you have a chart, for example, of listing what your corporate governance highlights are, but you certainly don't need to go into any other detail. Uh, and smaller reporting companies have a little bit more time. They have until uh, filings covering the first field fiscal period beginning on or after October 1st, 2023. And the Section 16 amendments uh, relate to Forms 4 and 5 filed on or after April 1st, uh, 2023. Uh, so let's go to slide 32 uh, now, because I want to talk about some of the considerations that issuers have. If you haven't done so already, make directors and officers aware of the new Rule 10 b 51 requirements and the rapidly approaching uh, February 27th uh, effective date. Um, you know, emphasizing, for example, the cooling off periods, the modifications, uh, the restrictions on multiple overlapping plans and single trading plans. Um, companies should also uh, be able uh, uh, to bring their compensation committee members up to speed on uh, the disclosure requirements for option and option like compensation awards made close in time to the company's disclosure of MNPI. Ideally, this should be done before the next anticipated grant date to give committees time to assess whether they want to adjust the timing of such awards. And be sure to inform directors and Section 16 officers that they're going to have to report gifts within uh, two days. If you prepare the uh, forms on their behalf, be sure they understand they've got to get you their gift information now as promptly as they do uh, when they do sales or, or purchases. And if you plan to revise your insider trading policies and procedures to reflect the amend amendments, you want to build in a process to explain uh, the new or updated requirements to covered persons. Uh, next slide, please. You're going to need some disclosure controls. Uh, I'd make it a priority uh, to update the company's Rule 10b51 trading practices. Uh, be sure, for example, uh, there's a procedure that directors and officers notify the company when they adopt and when they terminate a 10b51 plan because the company has uh, disclosure obligations in that regard. And you should also uh, be, uh, at, get copies of newer modified plans 
and uh, confirm compliance with the new uh, requirements, including the certification of good faith, which is likely to be in the plan document itself. And remember to extend your disclosure controls to collect information for non 10 b 51 trading arrangements because companies also have to make disclosures regarding them. And remember to add a disclosure control for the exhibit filing requirement for the uh, uh, insider trading plan. Next slide, please. You certainly want to have a disclosure control uh, of when option and option like awards are made close in time to an MNPI. Um, this could include monitoring uh, grants within four business days or one uh, business day after the 10K, 10Q and 8K. Um, and uh, you also uh, may wanna have the compensation committee consider whether or not uh, when they're thinking about timing for grants, uh, whether proximity to other milestones uh, and material developments uh, uh, might also be important in their scheduling. And companies should be considering the, narr the impact of the narrative disclosure uh, you know, on investor relations uh, and also proxy advisors um, who might be concerned about uh, seeing option awards granted close to uh, the release of MNPI. Next si slide, please. It may be appropriate for companies to uh, amend their trading policies, for example, to reflect uh, the new 10 b 51 and disclosure amendments. Um, and any company that doesn't have a formal insider trading policy at this point should consider adopting one to avoid the uh, negative disclosure that we mentioned earlier. Uh, in the plan itself, if you uh, the policy for insider trading, uh, if you want to address the use of 10 b 51 plans, you want to consider, do you want to encourage the use, require the use, or simply uh, state that any such plan uh, has to be uh, in compliance with the rule. And uh, you may want to make it real clear that uh, entry into trading plans uh, has to uh, be pre-cleared. Uh, and it's possible you may want to reevaluate blackout and window periods, especially if you base them on earnings releases as opposed to 10K and 10Q filings. And you also might want to evaluate what your insider trading policies treatment of uh, gifts is right now. Uh, next slide. It's good news for public companies that the cooling off periods and the restrictions on multiple overlapping plans and single trade plans don't apply. Um, but nevertheless, the SEC has made it clear uh, that it's concerned about issuer use of 10B51 plans, and it's considering whether it needs to mitigate uh, the uh, potential for misuse. Um, so you really need to, uh, if you're with a public company that considers share buybacks, to monitor the SEC developments. Um, as uh, Anna mentioned at the beginning of the program, the SEC uh, is still uh, working on its final share purchase disclosure rule. Uh, it's currently targeted for April, uh, but it could be earlier or later. Uh, and it's really something that has to uh, uh, be monitored. Uh, you know, it was initially proposed at the same time as the uh, 10B51 amendments, and it's something that goes hand in hand. So slide 37, please. Um, just a few other considerations uh, on this slide. Um, you know, prepare your investor relations to respond to insider trading issues. Uh, consider whether you have sufficient employees to handle the new disclosure uh, controls. There's a lot to think about, but I wanna turn the program back over to Anna to turn about, uh, talk about some other uh, considerations. Sure, thanks, Laura. Um, so the next, We'll we'll go to the slide after that. As I mentioned at the outset, um, <laughs> most of the work here is for issuers and for directors and officers, but uh, investment banks that are um, active in helping to execute 10B51 programs for um, 
insiders as well as for employees are going to want to review all of their forms. And so, um, as I mentioned at the outset, again, a lot of issuers rely on 10B51 plans in connection with repurchase plans. Investment banks are going to want to review all of the representations and warranties um, that are referenced in connection with Rule 10B51, whether that's in repurchase plans or, or otherwise. So all of those are going to have to um, have a very close look and going to have to be revised. And to Laura's point, they'll probably need revision again once we have the benefit of the final share repurchase disclosure rules. Um, on the next slide, most of the work um, for investment banks is going to be um, with um, respect to updating their forms for um, individuals, for uh, individuals or, or entities that are significant holders. So for directors, officers, insiders, and employees. So these forms need a very close look um, to ensure that they have the appropriate cooling off periods. Many um, broker uh, plans already had a cooling off period, um, but as Dave discussed, different cooling off periods apply. So those have to be addressed. Um, most banks likely will um, decide that they need additional representations, um, including representations regarding compliance with the assurance policy. Um, many already have this. They may not be as fulsome as one would want in light of the amendments. Adoption of the plan in good faith. Uh, again, while many plans had a general representation, I would think that it would be prudent to incorporate the language now, since we have it specifically referring to good faith. Um, I think uh, there's going to be some thinking and probably some variation in practice in terms of what um, brokers do with respect to other plans, other plans in place, the extent to which brokers are going to want to diligence or schedule other plans um, that are in place. Um, to, you know, being those that are permissible, obviously, um, and what they will um, want to do or allow um, to be done um, on a, you know, in, in conjunction with their compliance um, group and want to think about from a franchise perspective what they're comfortable with. Uh, the broker will want uh, a covenant re regarding um, reporting and disclosure. Um, obviously, that's up to the issuer in part, um, but um, many brokers are also had an addendum or an annex that was an issuer representation. Um, for those that didn't, they may want to think about adding an exhibit or an attachment that includes at least for directors and officers an acknowledgement by the issuer. Um, in conjunction with amending all these plans, um, it's a very good time to address Form 144 filings. Um, so oftentimes investment banks used to do the Form 144 filings. Of course, no, now those have to be electronic. Um, it's really not feasible for brokers to do that and get the codes and whatnot. So it may be a good time um, to make all those changes if that hasn't been addressed already in 10B51 sales trading plan updates. So that's a, a very um, quick uh, rundown of changes. Some resources for you um, that uh, you'll find as well on our blog and on our website. Um, we've got a number of questions um, and um, we will respond to those um, a little bit after uh, the session today. We thank all of you for tuning in today, and we appreciate very much your time and attention. Uh, this materials will be circulated together with a link to a recording. And if you have any questions, Dave, Laura, Jen, and I are happy to answer them or any uh, of your contacts at Mayor Brown. Thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate it.